and uh, another great opportunity for us to come together uh, in, uh, in Bible class, a, a chance for us to lean in, to learn, to gain some insight. I'm excited about today's lesson uh, because it takes, uh, again, um, I, was, uh, I was talking to my mom the other day. I usually call her on Thursdays and uh, check in on her. And, uh, and she says, uh, she usually has something to say about my Bible class. And, uh, and she says, well, I want you to know I've read Daniel. And I know oh, that's good. It's good prep for, for the class. And, and she goes, there's a lot of stuff in Daniel I wasn't aware of. You know, there's kind of some unknown or at least unfamiliar stories. And there's lots of them in such a small book. And so I, I have found there have been just tremendous insights just for me personally to be able to look at this and go, boy, if we are considering ourselves Daniels in this world and in this time, that is it is, it is deeply meaningful as we go through Daniel. And, and one of the things I, have, I appreciate about God's Word uh, is just how applicable it is. Uh, a lot of times we miss when we just kind of say, oh, there's a neat story, and you kind of move beyond it. Um, I think that's one of the powers of Bible class, right? That there's a chance for us to learn and, and to gain some insight that helps me right here, right now. So uh, let's jump in. got lots to cover today. Um, <laughs> Somebody was telling me, they said, well, how long is today's? And, uh, and as far as on the paper, you guys are starting to gauge whether or not I can actually finish in the 45 minutes. Um, and, and again, I'm going to blame the clock that is behind me over here, right? That's going to be my, my running, uh, running joke for us. So in Daniel 5, if you want to open up to that, to be able to look in there and just be able to scan it while we're, while we're talking about it, I want you to know that uh, 20 years have passed between chapter 4 and chapter 5. Now, can somebody, just for a point of review, uh, remind us what was so unique about chapter 4 in Daniel? What was so unique about it? Made it stand out. The king acted like an animal. Oh. The king acted like an animal. Who was the one that wrote chapter 4? The king did. And that was unusual because you kind of had this personal testimony. The story certainly was bizarre. Right, that God's curse upon him for once again kind of going, yeah, yeah, right? That's not actually what he said, but he acted that way, right? God kind of said, you know, knock this off. He's like, yeah, yeah. And, and then pretty soon he's down on all fours uh, and, and living outside and, and so forth. Talks about his, you know, his, his fingernails become like claws. The dew of the morning is covering his body. His hair is long. And uh, for seven long years, uh, he's out mooing in the field, so to speak. Can't speak. Can't interact, and uh, and naturally the uh, the kingdom kind of gets a little wobbly, right? So now he has since passed away uh, and moved on. So I want to give you a little bit of a glimpse uh, for a couple of things when you read uh, chapter five. I really want to encourage you to do that um, at the back side of your sheet. There's those extra readings. One of them is chapter five, so that it it helps kind of reinforce and, and review what we talk about today. So this is the succession after Nebuchadnezzar, right? So the succession after him is one of his sons. There's kind of a, a distinction as far as how long he was king. We found various records. Some would say that his first son was uh, only uh, king for a year. Some would say four years. Uh, either way, he was assassinated, he was assassinated by uh, Nebuchadnezzar's son-in-law. So Nebuchadnezzar had a few daughters. Daughters got married. Uh, they thought, hey, I'd like to be king. They knocked off the current king. This son, right here, he became king. He was the son-in-law. So he assassinates his brother-in-law and then assumes the role of king. He gets knocked off in war, right? And he was only king for about two years, right? And then a guy by the name of Nabonidus, he becomes king by marrying one of these guys' wives. We're not sure who it was, but that's how he kind of gets in uh, with the royal family, marries one of the son's Wise. I couldn't figure out who it was. Most history wasn't sure on that. And so he becomes king of the empire okay, of Babylon. And his son, Belshazzar, who you're going to see in, is, our, is our point person in there, is the king of the city of Babylon. So here's what's happening. These guys are both king at the same time. Dad's king of the empire. Belshazzar's king of the city. So if you want to kind of think of president governor or maybe governor mayor, however you want to see it. They're both considered king. Um, so when we go back to this picture of uh, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had and, and what most people kind of assume each of the regions stood for, we're still at the head. 
right? So from Nebuchadnezzar, if you can kind of see it, Belshazzar, that's the span. But there's been five kings in that span. Kind of a lot of shaking up there for a while. Both his son, son-in-law, and then Nabonidus, and then his son uh, later on. However, Cyrus and Darius, you can't really see, I'm sorry, it's not really as clear as it should be. Um, they're about to enter onto the scene. And uh, Daniel is in the kingdom all the way up to here, right? So for all the kings uh, of Babylon, Daniel has been in captivity and working. And even for Cyrus, Cyrus is the one that tosses him in the lion's den. Okay, so if you kind of make that connection. So Daniel is really, he's, he's up to his hips in kings, right? He's just kind of, you know, this, this kind of mentality. So here's a statement that's made early on in Daniel 5. I think this is verse 7, um, or at least part of, uh, of that early section. The king called out loudly, bringing the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and all the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing, I'll tell you what it's talking about, and shows me its interpretation, shall be clothed with purple, have a chain of gold around his neck, and shall be third ruler in the kingdom. Now, the reason that may sound strange is because what he's talking about is he's talking about there's one, there's two, he'd be three. So when you see that, you're like, so he gave him the third job or the third position, who's the second, right? That's why it says third, just in case as you read that, it's like, well, that's kind of um, confounding. All right, so I, I think this was appropriate, right? Here's, here's the first fill-in. For Daniel, there's a new regime, same responsibility. Everybody connect the dots for us today, okay? New regime, same responsibility, right? No matter how you happen to feel about the election or the new administration or so forth, there is a new administration, okay, in our country, right? And there are changes being made and so forth. Guess what? We have the same responsibility. Now, might it change? Might the, you know, the challenges or the benefits, however we want to see them, may they uh, be altered? Absolutely, right? But Daniel, right, every time there was a new king, you know, God didn't kind of go, all right, you're off the hook. Retire. Right? Don't be a light in the world anymore. Instead, he just says, you still got the same job. Right? It might be a little harder. I think as you and I as Christians, if you travel around this globe, not a lot of us do that, but if you travel around this globe, guess what? Everywhere you go, you're to be his light. Everywhere. My wife and I, we kind of got hooked on, on watching this program. Maybe you're probably aware of it. It's called The Amazing Race, right? It, yeah. It's on, uh, it's on uh, what, what did we watch on? Hulu? We watch it on Hulu. So we can binge it, right? So you can watch one after the other because, for one, I'm not very patient. And, uh, and, and so we're, we're fascinated at all the different places they go and cultures that they go into. In fact, uh, one we were watching not too long ago. Where uh, the, the, the race is uh, it's around the world and there's different tasks they have to do and so you see it kind of entertaining kind of interesting it's kind of like the old uh, I think it was the old 50s movie around the world in 80 days right or there was another one Mad 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 World did you guys ever see that one that was another one from that time um, racing around the world for for a treasure or for you know money and uh, we we're watching this one and they were in uh, Abu Abu Dhabi I, I might be saying that right. Uh, Abu Dhabi, a heavily Muslim uh, uh, country, and, uh, and they went into a huge mosque, and all of the women in the race right, had to put on head coverings and take their shoes off, and as did the men, but just the shoes, and just the different cultures. So here you have these Americanized women, like, I don't know why I have to wear this, you know, because you're in Abu Dhabi, and, and we, we change how we deal with each culture, right? But God still calls us, called Daniel, to be a light no matter where you are. You might find yourself uh, in a highly uh, Republican voting environment, or you might find yourself in a highly Democratic environment, or you might find yourself in a place that just dis, you know, hates politics, and, and you are still called to be a light. doesn't matter what the political affiliation with people around you. It may shape what you talk about and how you talk about it. it doesn't change our job. Right? Our job is still the same to be light, and for Daniel it was the same. So I want to break this down in this way, and I'm going to break it down. You can look at these uh, maybe as you read on your own, as we kind of look at how Belshazzar uh, addresses this. So let me give you the synopsis of what's happening here, and then these uh, different pieces will make maybe a, a little bit clearer sense. Belshazzar is in the, the, the palace of 
uh, uh, Babylon, and, uh, and he is, again, the king of the city, not of the empire. That's dad, Nabonidus. And, uh, uh, and so he is inside, and the Persians and the Medes are outside. They're going to lay siege upon the city. And, and this is not a surprise. They've done this a few times already in history. However, the walls of Babylon, 350 feet tall, 28 feet thick. Right? I believe that's correct. And a huge brass gate uh, is the only gate. The Euphrates River runs right in front of the city and goes through. So in order to attack the city, you either have to cross this very narrow bridge to the gate, or you have to get across the river, the Euphrates River, which is flowing pretty good. All right? And so um, Nebuchadnezzar and, uh, and Belshazzar and any king before this felt pretty confident within the walls of Babylon. And so uh, in kind of a thumb in your nose up at King Cyrus, and uh, I forget who the king was for the Medes, uh, as they were you know, so, you know, preparing for battle outside of the city, Belshazzar decides to have a party. Right? He just gets together. And it was always about wine for the Babylonians. They were big into wine. I don't know if they you know, just were, were, I was going to say something about people who drink wine. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm going to slip there. I, I don't drink a lot of wine. Uh, but um, as, as he has it, he has this big party inside. Well, he has lots of people, lots of lords and ladies and things like that. And he says, well, we kind of don't have enough cups. I'm reading between the lines here to drink out of. And since they captured Jerusalem and the Holy Land uh, and so forth from the Hebrews, they brought with them all of the things that they grabbed from the tabernacle and the temple. All of the vessels and things that would be used by priests and ceremonies. And, and so they began to use those to drink the wine for their party. It was absolutely irreverent and, and uh, disdainful to God. And uh, so as a result, during the party, a disembodied hand, which means just a hand, uh, comes in, we don't know how big it was, and begins to write on the wall so that King Belshazzar can see it. And when he sees the words written there, he doesn't know what they say or what they mean. And so he was calling his uh, wise men and astrologers and enchanters going, tell me what this means. It seems like Babylon was always asking for help. Right? I had a dream, tell me what it means. I had another dream, tell me what that means. There's writing on the wall, tell me what that means. But obviously, if there's a, a disembodied hand writing on a wall and the king is, is had a party, he's probably going, this might be important to know. Right? I probably ought to know what this is. And so uh, nobody can answer the question. I'm going to tell you why in a second. And, uh, and his wife comes in, the wife of Belshazzar, who was probably because Nabonidus married to get into uh, the, the, holy, the, the, the royal family. Uh, it, is, it is safe to say that his mother then comes in, the queen, um, comes in and says, there's this guy by the name of uh, Belteshazzar, right, who is Daniel. And he used to interpret for your great-grandfather, you know, Nebuchadnezzar. And she goes, call him. Now, he's retired. I don't know if you retire as a prophet, but Daniel is probably retired. And, uh, and he comes in. He goes, yeah, I can translate it, but, but it ain't good. And he tells him, and then I'll explain it, what it is. And then, uh, and then everything goes uh, badly after that. So let me just kind of walk through this a little bit. So I'll kind of give you the summary here. You'll look at it hopefully on your own. First thing we see is the, uh, the, the king, Belshazzar, uh, enjoying his feast. Now, I'm going to try to keep bringing us back to our context here um, in our country, because I think there's tremendous similarities uh, between our country and Babylon, right? Uh, Babylon, by the way, I'm going to reference this a little bit later. Babylon is referred to even in Revelation during the judgment uh, of Judgment Day. In Babylon is the name of the harlot or the prostitute uh, that has prostituted herself to this world, right? Tremendous blessings and power have been bestowed upon her, but she used it to fulfill her own desires and her own flesh. And you could say, that has a lot to do with the United States. That's not only the United States, a lot of other very godless lands that are, that are focused upon their own benefits and their own prosperity. Um, but there are certainly some, some uh, transferable principles for us. So even though the city is besieged, the king felt self-confident. Right? So while the, the Medes and the Persians are literally outside, now imagine this, there's the bronze gate 
there's the bridge, there's the Euphrates River, pretty good sized river, kind of think of the size of the Missouri, um, and they're on the other side. So this has not been the first time that they have seen, um, you know, people coming up against Babylon. Now, Babylon is pretty well fortified. And so they kind of get used to seeing it. They would have had soldiers and things posted on the bridge and, and being watching from over the tower, and, and they can't get through the gate very easily. And, and uh, so they're pretty confident. They're like, listen, we're safe in here. Kind of like you and I, right? If you've ever been in a really bad storm, right, if you're in your house or maybe in your car, you're like, I feel safer when the doors are closed or locked and the windows are down, whatever the case may be. We kind of feel that same sense of security, right? So King Belshazzar, he feels pretty confident in there. And, and really to demonstrate that sense of confidence, he says, let's have a party. Let's crack the wine casks and let's uh, get some glasses and things like that and let's, let's have a party. I don't know if you've ever had a, a gathering at your house that's big enough to where you run out of your regular glasses and then you got to divert to the, the plastic ones that you got from McDonald's 10 years ago or, or paper cups or things like that. Now, that is not the reference I'm trying to make it to the temple where, but that's a lead sense to me what he sees. He says, we're out of the goblets and things that we drink from. Get those things that we got from the Hebrews, right, and the things that we got from the temple. Now, Belshazzar, he could care less. He, he didn't uh, uh, acknowledge at this point, this is a few generations past Nebuchadnezzar, he didn't acknowledge the Hebrew God, right? He says, I acknowledge Bel, Baal, and, and, uh, and so forth. So uh, not interested in, in worrying about that. One of the things that we see uh, is necessary for us here in this land, for us as Christians, uh, is this next one. So I want to uh, invite you to open up to uh, 2 Timothy. If you're there in Daniel 5, keep your finger there. Uh, but look up in the New Testament, 2 Timothy 4 and 5. 2 Timothy 4 and 5. Near the end uh, of the uh, New Testament. Not too far from it. 2 Timothy 4 and 5. Make sure you're in 2 Timothy, please. And somebody read that when they have it. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So for us as Christians, I think one of the things that's important as I read this story um, is for us to demonstrate sober judgment, right? Uh, Belshazzar, Belshazzar and uh, the people that were gathered together uh, probably were not sober, okay? Now, that doesn't necessarily contribute or, or, or take away from the story other than they were not focused where they should be focused. And they thought, you know, drinking wine and celebrating, that's the answer. Right? That's how we're going to deal with our own dysfunction and our own brokenness and so forth. And so for you and I, it is imperative. I, that, that verse, by the way, is not talking about alcohol. Okay? It says, you know, be sober-minded. It's not to say, don't drink. Right? It's not saying that. I talked about that in the sermon this morning uh, a little bit. I mentioned it, so if, you, if you're coming next service, you'll understand that reference. But what our, we're called to do is to have clear thinking. Right? Belshazzar did not have clear thinking about what was important in his kingdom and why God had blessed him as king, put him in that role. Wouldn't it be something if every president that we ever had or have, right, would look to God as their main director? and the author of what they do. That, that, that is an accusation upon anyone who takes the role, right? What if they look to God, be sober-minded to say, I have been placed here by God, uh, by the Almighty, and so therefore what I do, what I say, I want to glorify Him. That would be incredible, right? That would be incredible. Um, so I, I think just as I think about um, how this all translates, uh, that's how it comes. So just to make a point, so you have a, a reference, King Belshazzar drank from the vessels captured from the Jews' temple, the Hebrews' temple at this point. Uh, they'd still be referred to uh, in the Old Testament. But so they used the vessels that were reserved for special ceremonial ritual things with the priests and so forth. And he's just handing these things out so that people can drink and get drunk. Okay? Obviously an abuse of what God had, had a different purpose for. Uh, I, I think you could probably imagine something similar here, right? Um, as much as I love our youth uh, and our children and so forth, I don't think I want to open the sanctuary to a volleyball game, right? I think that there's probably better places for that. That would probably be a little irreverent uh, to be running around and playing volleyball in our sanctuary. Not to mention our lights and our stained glass would take a beating. 
right? Uh, and I think that's just a sense of respect for God's house. Not that we can't do. We have a gymnasium. I praise the Lord for that uh, or different things. But they have a purpose. They have a use. These vessels in the temple had a use. They had a purpose. What Belshazzar was doing is perverting that purpose and that use and, and really thumbing his nose up at God uh, in the meantime. And, and that has uh, a sense of importance for us. Um, in your Bibles, please go to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 3. 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. You're not far from it if you're there in 2 Timothy. Go backwards a little bit. Come, come toward the front. 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. All right, Melody, thank you. So there is uh, an abruptness uh, of the presence and the actions of God many times. So here's my question as we think about our country, where we are now. Is there an urgency for us? You bet there is, right? Uh, I, I think, it, I, I don't know how you can see it any differently. When you watch the news, even over the last couple of weeks, the amount of things that are changing and the kind of things that are changing, there is an urgency, right? But there's an urgency to deliver the good news of Jesus uh, in a world that is clearly going to become more lost. Now, the world has always struggled with finding, uh, you know, the way that God has laid out, for sure. I, I always think that every generation we find a new way to mess up, right? It's not the same all the time. Now, it's, it's the same sin. It's the same Adam and Eve sin. I don't want to follow God. I want to do my own thing. Right? I mean, serpent was, was so crafty. If you eat this fruit, what God didn't tell you, right, which means God's holding out, that's the first temptation, is that you'll be like him. You don't have to answer to him. You can be your own God. Guys, that's the same you know, temptation that is since the beginning of time. Belshazzar has given into that temptation. You're the king. You're in charge. You're not there by any other purpose, by any other means like God. Instead, you are king. So... Use it. Soak it up. You know? Uh, and, and so, when we see this, as we think of our role as Daniels and Esthers in this world, is there an urgency? You bet there is. I've said this often in here, and I'll continue to say it. I don't know how long we have. I don't mean that from the end of the world standpoint. I don't know how long I have. You don't know how long you have. And so, what do you want to spend your time doing? Waiting for the perfect opportunity? It's now. I can just solve that for you, right? As we come together, this is training. This is, you know, motivation. This is filling us with boldness and courage to then leave this place and be his church. And we're also going to be his church while we're in here for each other as well. There didn't need to be such a loss of life, right? And I'll tell you when the Medes and the Persians come in. Um, Belshazzar, by the way, I'll tip my hand a little bit here. He dies this very night because of the invasion. Right? He dies tonight. So, so God sends the writing, sends the message. Uh, and I'll tell you what the message is in a second here. You can read it there if you're looking at Daniel 5. Uh, because Daniel does uh, uh, interpret it, translate it for him. And, uh, and he dies this very night. This isn't a warning. Right? Nebuchadnezzar got a year. Remember that? Right? Where Daniel comes to him and goes, God is fed up with your behavior and your you know, malpractice as a king. And, uh, and, and so you need to straighten up and fly right. And then that one day he's walking around his, uh, his rooftop of his castle. And he's looking around going, man, I'm good. Right? And right about then, all down on all fours and starts mooing or whatever happened to be the case. He's suddenly a beast. Right? It says while well, the words were still on his lips. Uh, but he had a year to straighten up. Belshazzar has maybe about 45 minutes. But God's warning wasn't to straighten up. It was, I just want to let you know, it's over. What you've done with the vessels in the temple, that's it. I'm done. Right? And the judgment is here. And the judgment is for people that are still there. The judgment is for us uh, several thousand years later to be able to understand that. But there didn't need to be such a loss of life. If Belshazzar would have been a good leader, would have cared about his people and said what is most um, what is the most beneficial to my people is to follow God. Nebuchadnezzar finally came around to that. Okay, He didn't pass it on to his boys, evidently, or his grandson, or, or, or the rest of his family. Um, 
But when I think of our country, right, sometimes we want to just circle up the wagons and go, come Lord Jesus, come. I've heard people say it. I've even said it sinfully, I'm afraid. Uh, when I'm kind of like going, I am overwhelmed sometimes at the, at, at the absolute depravity uh, of this world and the things that are happening. And sometimes I just want to, you know, pull the old ostrich trick of just put my head in the sand and go, oh, I just want it to be over, right? And not my life and not the world, but just all of the chaos and the ugliness. Sometimes don't we kind of long for days of old, right? And we kind of go, oh, I wish it were fill in the blank, right? And, uh, and we do that. And yet what I recognize is that in our world right now, um, there is a great loss of life and vitality and health and positivity because of leadership. Now, I don't say that to say shame on them. I'm telling us we're the solution, right? Our job is to shape the world around us, and that means all the way to the top. Daniel was placed in a, in a position to influence five kings, right? And God gave him this incredible ability to, to translate and to interpret and so forth. You might be given a position where you are to influence influencers, right? I mean, isn't that kind of our job as Christians, to influence influencers? Our job is to, is to light lights, okay? And, and so forth. That's, that's our purpose as a parent. If you've been a parent, isn't that our job? I want you to be a benefit to this world. So I'm going to pour into you such things so that you are. I don't want to make the world worse through you. I want to make it better, okay? And then there's the way that I interact with people I work with and talk to and live with and, and socialize with and things like that. I want to make the world better for God, let his light shine. But we want to make disciples that will make disciples that will make disciples. And, and yet, when we don't, there's a greater loss of life because those that should have been better influenced and haven't been, they continue their evil. Does that make sense? You guys understand what I'm saying, right? There doesn't have to be the level of loss that there is today. I, I, I believe that 100%. There doesn't have to be that much loss. I want you to think back. I, I, I'm going to take some <coughs> preacher prerogative. Uh, in my previous church, my secretary, when I would send something to her and you put this in the sermon notes to her. She would say, is that PP? That's preacher's prerogative. Right? That's where I take a little deviation and go, I'm going to stretch those scriptures a little bit, right? I wonder if there were more people that were following God, there would have been more than Noah and his family on the ark. <clears throat> Could there have been 30 people on the ark? If there were 30 people going, I want to follow God. There didn't have to be such a loss of life on the planet. But the fact that it was so depraved and so evil and so forth that only Noah and his family uh, were on the ark. It wasn't because other really good people didn't make it. Right? It was because there weren't any more. It doesn't have to be like that. And, and so I, I guess my encouragement to you, and maybe the challenge, is, is don't fall back on saying, well, it is so bad that, that, it, that the world is beyond hope. When the world is beyond hope, Jesus comes back. That's what it's done. And so if he's not here, we still got work to do. And that work is to be light. And that work is to influence. And that work is to, to move and move and mobilize and, and things like that. All right. So um, just as a point of reference here, where are the Daniels in this country? In this reference. I'm going to talk about Esther here in a, in, in a few weeks. But where are the Daniels in this country? We are the ones that are going to help our world interpret what they see. Um, by the way, the, um, the old phrase, the writing is on the wall, comes from this story. You can look it up. Right? I did, because I was almost sure that was true. I'm like, I, I'm not sure where else that would come from. But if somebody says, hey, listen, the writing's on the wall. Okay? In fact, I heard somebody say that in a, uh, in a political context uh, just the other day, and it kind of jogged me, and I'm kind of like going, that's got to be from Daniel 5. Right? And so I looked it up on, I Googled it, okay? Um, and, uh, and that is where it comes. So this, this has some, some longevity to it that we're kind of like, you know, when the writing was on the wall for King Balthazar, it was basically kind of going, you have been measured, you have been found wanting, and your kingdom is over. That's basically what the writing on the wall is. And I'll, I'll break that down for you in just a second. All right. So the next thing that happens, not only does he enjoy his feast, but it's revealing his fear. Right? As he sees the writing on the wall and so forth, a disembodied hand writing something. By the way, initially, 
he can't understand. He only understands it once Daniel's on the scene. So he sees this, and he's like, not only is this this bizarre, you know, uh, miraculous thing happening, I don't know what it means. That's pretty scary, okay? Um, you know, imagine that you're in a foreign land, and uh, you're in a hotel, and there's sirens going off and lights flashing and things like that. You run out into the hallway, and you're like, what are we supposed to do? I don't know if it's a fire alarm, a tornado alarm, a tsunami alarm. Uh, I don't know what to do. And, and everything around you is written in a foreign language, and you don't know it. That'd be kind of terrifying, right? You're like, there's urgency. I'm not sure how I'm supposed to respond, okay? And, and yet this hand is, you know, writing on the wall, the plaster wall. Um, I don't know how big it was. I'm going to show you a couple pictures of something that Rembrandt put together. I thought it was kind of interesting, but uh, anyhow. So something's revealed about his fear. Um, what we recognize is fear for uh, Belshazzar didn't solve the problem. That's not what God was after. I just want you to be afraid. What would have solved the problem is a relationship with God, like Nebuchadnezzar eventually had. So here's what, I, here's what I don't think is a good idea for us as Christians, okay, to bring this kind of to, to, to formally uh, hear where we are. For us to march around with signs that says God's judgment is upon this country, turn or burn, okay? There was a, a group once, uh, if you recall, um, the Westboro Baptist Church. You guys remember them in the news, not... Uh, maybe a decade ago now, quite a while ago, or uh, I don't know that they're still out and around. They used to uh, protest many times military funerals and, and, and have awful things on their signs of judgment. And they were cruel um, and they were ill-timed. And I, I remember I was part of a group uh, called the Patriot Riders, the Patriot Guard, a uh, motorcycle group that would show up and, and kind of help uh, stand at a, at a flag line at, at uh, military funerals and so forth for the family. And uh, I didn't get a chance to do it very much because I wasn't really that available. But I remember going to one, and uh, this Westboro Baptist was there. It was, uh, I forget the name of the military cemetery in St. Louis. That's where it was. And uh, they're there with their signs, and they, they, they seemed to be hung up on judgment against homosexuality. And they would, uh, they would accuse the military as, as uh, fighting for those rights and so on, how wrong it was. And, and the point I'm trying to make is that those signs and those protests had nothing to do with inviting people into a relationship with God. They were just words of hate. And, uh, and I thought about how, how um, disconcerting that was for me as a pastor. As I'm listening to another church that claims to love Jesus and called by God, uh, that is not inviting people into a relationship at all. In fact, I would imagine anybody who heard them, saw them, had any experience with them says, whoever you worship, I don't want any part of it. None. Right? Because you claim that there's a God of love, and yet what you're behaving uh, like and what you're talking about seems to be a God of vengeance and anger and, and division and, and how awful that must be. I remember having them in my, uh, they were right behind me in my ear, uh, yelling and screaming, and we were standing up with our flags uh, at attention while the family was driving through and, and coming in with the hearse and going to the site. And I remember just taking the flag and just, holding it up like this, just trying to, I just want you to not see it when you drive by. Uh, you just couldn't drown them out. And, and, uh, and I just thought to myself, I actually turned around and talked to one of them after the, the procession went by. And I just asked myself, what's your goal being here? You know, is your, is your goal to show the love of Jesus uh, to people? Because that's our job as Christians. And, and he, you know, he yelled some things at me. He's kind of worked up and so forth. And what did I know? And, and, and so forth. And I'm like, you and I worship different people. I said, I, there is nothing about God in what you're saying um, in this. Now, does, does God happen to say something about homosexuality in his word? Yes, he does. Okay? Does he say, now go out and please beat everybody over the head with my law? No, he doesn't. Find a winsome way of communicating my love and plan and obedience for this world. Um, anyhow, uh, it, it's just one of those things. So, so, so us uh, uh, like exposing our world and leadership in our world, if we have an opportunity, to nothing but fear is not the solution, right? Turn or burn. If you don't go straight, um, you're going to go to hell, okay? And then you just think of people kind of going, that's it. I got I to gotta come around. Now, can it work in certain circumstances? Uh, yeah, it does. You remember when we talked about Jonah? Right? Jonah went to Nineveh, and he announced that God's judgment was coming. I don't think Jonah went around with, you know, a sign that says God hates Ninevites, right? And, and you all deserve to burn and, 
in, in eternal separation from God. I, I don't think, I think he said, God is fed up with you. He has sent me as a messenger. He said, in 40 days, if you don't turn around, he will destroy this city. Now, see, there's, a, there's an idea of kind of what, well, maybe we ought to evaluate whether or not we want to be destroyed or not. Okay? I think you can be blunt, and I think, well, I obviously believe I can be blunt, right? <laughs> I've never accused of anything short of that. The idea is that you can still be winsome, I hope, right, and still be blunt. I, what, I'm, what I'm pointing out is that even though Belshazzar was terrified by the hand, that wasn't the solution. It's not actually what God had intended. If he would have, he said, I, I want you to know this is coming. But instead, it's, it's his fear doesn't help. I don't want anybody to be afraid the last minute when Jesus comes again. There's going to be a lot of fear in this world when Jesus appears, right? There's going to be, uh, you know, Jews today, Orthodox Jews, that when Jesus comes, they're going to go, finally, and we're going to go back in time, right? This is not the one uh, that you are expecting. This is not uh, the David King-like figure that finally arrives and builds up the Holy Land once again. This is the Savior, and this is his return, and you missed it the first time, right? They'll be terrifying. Uh, there'll be people that, that will, you know, wailing and gnashing of teeth outside the gate, saying, we, we said your name, we preached your name, and so forth. And God will say, it says it in Matthew, he said, go away from me, I do not know you, relationship. You can, you can spout all the facts and things about God. When I, when I watch on occasion, um, just out of pure sick uh, humor, uh, sometimes the, the um, uh, televangelists that I'll watch, once I'll flip through the channels and I'll, I'll see, uh, what's, what's a real smiley guy? Joel Osteen, thank you. You're all guilty. <laughs> that was a test. That was a test. It's okay to know. It's okay to know what's, what's going on out there. Uh, but when you listen to him, I mean, he says a lot about God. Right? But I can tell you, not much of it is biblical. And if you have an opinion about Joel Osteen, you think that some of the things he says are good, come talk to me. Right? We don't want to be following Joel Osteen. And, uh, and, and yet, I believe that Joel, unless... God touches his heart and brings him around and, and he relents. Um, he's going to be one of those banging on the, the gate outside kind of going, but I, I preached in your name. I spoke your name. And, and God will say, if he doesn't change his ways, I do not know you. Right? Don't have a relationship with you. Alright. So it only takes, for Belshazzar, only one generation to forget the things of God. Right? It only takes one generation. In fact, 10 and 11 of Daniel 5 is really where the queen comes in and says, there's this guy named Daniel and he is to interpret dreams uh, for your great-grandfather. Right? Or for your grandfather. I think I got that wrong. And so you're kind of like, well, why didn't Belshazzar know that? Why wasn't there a, a story that us attached with remember when your grandfather was like acting like a beast of the field walking around for seven years outside? Remember that? We talk about it when we have our family reunions. Right? You remember that? You, kind of go, oh, you remember Grandpa? That was a crazy time. You know? And, and then he became king again and then began to follow God and he was committed and, and you're like, well, how come that didn't get passed along? I, I, I want to tell you a, a, a sociological reality. It only takes one generation for people to stop believing in God. Do you realize if you don't tell your children, they're not likely going to hear it from you? The most influential people in their world. It takes one generation to get lost. Okay? I often think about that when people kind of say, well, who's, who's going to be saved when, when Jesus comes back? What about the, the tribes of, of uh, you know, indigenous tribes in, in different lands? Like I, some people ask me about the aborigines down in Australia. How can God punish them for not knowing God? Now, if you go back in history, did their original people that eventually came to find themselves on Australia's continent, were they aware of God? Yes, they were. And at some point in time, they decided not to follow God. Is there a consequence for that? For seven generations after. God talks about it. If you don't share this with your children, there's a consequence for your actions. And that gets visited upon generation after generation. Okay? You and I have a responsibility. It's not new and improved Christianity 2.0. This is our God-given responsibility to make sure that the ones that God has empowered you to influence, that you influence for his glory. All right. Okay. So then he discovers his future. 
doesn't know what the letters on the, on the wall say and so forth. And so he says, well, what does this mean? What does it say? And so Daniel comes in because the queen says, call this guy Daniel. I know he's retired, might be on the golf course in Babylon uh, and so forth. But come and find him and he can translate this for you. Now, the, uh, the translation is actually given to us in, in chapter 5. But it would have looked like this. Now, the reason it looked like this, I know in your Bibles, if you're looking at it, it says, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson. That's the words that Daniel gives. But it is in Aramaic, and Aramaic is what they call a consonantal language. It doesn't have vowels. So what it would have seemed like, now, I'm writing them in English. That's not Aramaic. They would have been, actually, um, they would have looked like this, potentially. Okay? We don't actually know what they would have, how they would have been written, but it would have been right to left, very similar to Hebrew. Um, this is actually written by, uh, drawn by Rembrandt. This was a, a, a painting by Rembrandt. So this is supposed to be Belshazzar. There's the disembodied hand and the writing, and, and there's a lady over here spilling wine out of the temple goblet. Somebody over here looking very concerned that the king is scared. But Rembrandt put this together. Um, some people have kind of speculated that if this is how it was written, if you look at these letters and these letters, they're identical. You see the repetition? That could be mene, mene, right, if that's how we look at it. So mene, mene, tekel, parson, and it, it continues instead of going down below. If that's the way the hand wrote it, you don't have vowels in here, so you're not sure what it means. If, if you were to write a note to somebody and remove all of the vowels, you realize you'd be like going, I'm not sure what that said. I could guess. Do you think Belshazzar wanted to guess? No. I need to know what that hand has written on the wall, right? And so what they discover is that it means, and Daniel says it's in Daniel 5. You read it tonight, you'll see it. It basically means you have been weighed, you have been measured, and your kingdom will be divided. Now, the interesting thing about that is, is these are actually nouns, right? These are weights, measures, and divided things, right, would be the language. And then he turns it into verbs. That's kind of what you can do with language, at least ancient languages. Why does it say weights, right? It means that it implies that you have been weighed. You have been evaluated. You have been measured. And obviously the measure that is being used here is God's expectation. And you have been found wanting, and your kingdom is about to be divided. And the, Pete, the Medes and the Persians are outside waiting to do that very thing. As Christians, church, we know the future. Daniel could interpret the writing on the wall, right? We know that there is writing on the wall in this land. We know there is writing on the wall in this world. We know that this is a preamble. This life on earth is a preamble for the next. We know that because God tells us that. God talks us often about the kingdom of God is like, right? That he opens a way for us. This is not our home. We are pilgrims passing through. But we are ultimately prayerfully because of Christ on our way to see him in the new heaven and the new earth. Right? And, and so it doesn't mean that we passively sit here and twiddle our thumbs, but this is not the end game. This is the preamble to what is truly coming. And so then what we see is here. We, he sees where he meets his fate. And this is where the Persians and the Medes they invade. They actually do something really fascinating historically saying what they did is about five miles upriver of the Euphrates River, out of sight of Babylon, uh, they diverted the river. This was brilliant. They began to dig another canal to drop it down into this big valley. You can actually see it today. They believe this is what took place. And so what it did is it dropped the level of the river down so far. They could walk across the river, not the bridge. Soldiers wouldn't see them. And suddenly they were upon them and in the in the. Uh, in the city and captured them and killed the king and so forth. Um, brilliant, brilliant uh, military uh, practice. So uh, King Cyrus then takes control, and, and we're going to pick that up uh, again uh, in next week. Now, uh, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, would have been helpful for Belshazzar. I'm not going to read this, but God actually, through the prophet Isaiah, tells Babylon that they're going to be captured by King Cyrus. Right? And that would have been really good to read. Okay? My point of saying that is, you know, that the Bible informs us of what's going to happen in this world. It informs us. We use it as our guide to be able to say, how should we look to this world? How should we, how should we proceed? Okay? I remember once when I was uh, living in Michigan, is when I was in Pawpaw. 
right? And uh, I got to know our, our local representative, nice Christian guy, and got to know him and, and so forth. But I had one spring session when they were about to open Congress there in Lansing, right, the, the state capital there uh, in Michigan. He said, would you come and give the opening prayer, right, a benediction, right, to start their spring session to say, you know, ask God's blessing upon it. And I thought, oh, that would be fantastic. What a, what a tremendous opportunity. And, and my wife, Kristen, and my son, Noah, got to... Uh, come and see and sit up in the, the balcony and, and kind of watch this happen. <laughs> what I was so disappointed is, is less than half of them were there. Right? Not only were they not there ready to get in session, but they were a bunch of them were meeting in a back room haggling out some kind of policy they're doing. So I'm up there kind of looking out on what I look out most of the time on Sunday mornings. Right? There's two people here, a person there, another person there. There wasn't a pandemic at that time. And I remember just kind of going, you know what? Whoever's here, going to hear the blessing of God, right? And, uh, and, and so if we were to go forward with that knowledge and that understanding, what a blessing that would be. Um, King Belshazzar would have been blessed by that as well. I did find a painting that kind of shows this. Here's the, the bronze gate. Here's the bridge that would have entered in. This is the Euphrates River. And here's the soldiers walking across, uh, wading across about knee deep, and then coming up and, and so forth. Um, and there's a picture of kind of maybe what the walls and things would have looked like. Uh, Babylon's been wiped out, have been for centuries, in fact, millennia. Uh, but uh, anyhow, just kind of picking that apart from history. So if, if uh, Isaiah would have helped Belshazzar, what scriptures would you use to help those around us? I'm not asking for an answer, but for you to consider that. One of the things I really appreciate, and I know he won't like this, uh, but uh, I appreciate Don uh, giving us that scripture in the morning here to start things off. And he did that from memory, right? Do you realize how important memorized scripture is to us? I, I know that most of us have our smartphones and can whip it out and open it up and things like that. But it's when things are down that I believe the Holy Spirit brings those verses up. And if you've had that happen, you know what I'm talking about. Those times you're kind of like going, I need to be reminded of that. Bing, there it is. Sometimes for me it comes through a hymn or a song that I'll hear and go, oh, that's from Jeremiah. And, and don't, don't fret about um, whether or not you can give chapter and verse. Okay? Just get the word of God right. Okay, this is what God says and how that would be helpful. Just in wrapping up, Babylon is a picture of the future Babylon. I talked about that in Revelation. Right? It is a picture. So the evil of Babylon is something that carries through all the way to Judgment Day. So one day, if, if you and I are still here when Jesus returns, um, we're going to suddenly have this aha moment. You're like, oh, this is Babylon. Not this. Maybe this. I don't know. But we're going to understand it in that context. Um, the writing is on the wall. I believe absolutely. When you look at a, at a country like ours that is, that is getting farther and farther away from a God-centered obedience and following, uh, the writing is on the wall. So guess what? Our job is to try to change it, is to try to be able to say, but here is what is right. Uh, we just talked about um, you know, uh, Sanctity of Life Sunday and, and uh, the march that is happening kind of weird this year being virtual and so forth in D.C., uh, but a chance for us to be able to say that this is important. It's not just a thing. It's critical, right, to be able to honor and cherish all life, right? So we can either say, well, listen, that's our opinion, but if other people have their own opinions, that's okay. It's not okay, right? It's wrong. And, and we have to step up and influence from the inside, right, and, and not just hold signs and dictate and yell and scream, but instead to make changes. The blind rulers continue in their pride. Just like Belshazzar, we have blind rulers today. And they continue in their pride. And I, that's not a, that's not a, a condemnation of, upon our current administration. That's a condemnation upon all administrations. Everybody gets high on their own power. right? It's a drug. And, and you see it every time. Right? Um, I, I just, uh, I, I'm amazed that, that we pick our favorites, and yet they're all guilty of pride. We are too. Right? But the, the key is, is don't be blind. Belshazzar didn't understand the writing on the wall. We should. We've given the, been given the word of God. We've been given the Holy Spirit. Uh, we should know that. And, and the final is this. The Lord is coming. Right? There is going to be judgment day, the end of all things. And we want to be prepared. And, and it's not just for your and my sake that I want to. It's for the sake of those that do not yet know there were so many people in the palace there with Belshazzar that didn't need to perish because he was a godless, power-hungry monarch, right? Uh, instead, to be able to recognize that there were people that needed uh, to be saved and preserved. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, I thank you for your goodness and your grace. I pray for your blessing upon, upon us as your church. Lord, may we go out from this place as Daniels in this world. We know the writing on the wall. We know the promises that you've made in your word. And, and Lord, grant us the zeal and the courage and the bravery to speak words of truth, winsomely and lovingly, but consistently. Uh, Lord, bless this land because of you. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.